All right, this is decryption encryption two. In this one, we're going to be covering the polyalphabetic ciphers and the Kaczynski method. Okay, last time we talked about monoalphabetic ciphers. That's the Caesar cipher. That's just shifting over by one. Well, a way of fixing that, making it harder, would be a polyalphabetic. So, what would polyalphabetic mean? Two alphabets. Multiple alphabets. Multiple, right. Multiple, more like than one. Mono would be one. Poly is more than one. Okay. So the single alphabet, we knew the index of coincidence was 0 0.660667. That's based about 1972 writing, because nowadays our writing is so different. Okay. I was actually uh, reading a post. It was funny because other than me, did anyone learn to type on an actual... Typewriter, and then the end of the line. You did. Okay. Well, what do we do at the end of the, the sentence? Space, space. Remember that? Well, we don't need that anymore. <laughs> Someone actually wrote a nose post. You know, now with, with fixed, that was with fixed response. No, we no longer need it. So at the end of a sentence, we really should only be putting one space. But I've been doing it for so long. I don't think I can put a single space. I really don't think I can. It's, uh. Okay. So, 1972 is what that number comes from. If you look at something written about, I actually tried to find something. Wow, it was hard. It was really hard. All right. So, multiple alphabets flatten, flattens this. Because now instead of, you know, like E's being the most popular, if we shift it over something, maybe D's the most popular now. Shift it again, maybe C is the most popular. So, basically, it takes the, the, the way out of it, okay? So if we have one alphabet, 0.667. If we have two, it comes out to 0 0.052 and 0.47, so on and so forth. And the limited alphabets, 0.38. So if we took the English language and really just shifted it by one and did all the calculations again, we'd end up with 0 0.052 and so on and so forth, okay? So far, so good? Okay, so what if we have... The text says, this is a test. Okay, X, 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 X. First of all, why is it broken up into five character chunks? Anybody? No? It's, but when you, a lot of times when you see, what? No, it's not binary. But whenever, there's a lot of times when you see cryptography type stuff, they break it into five character chunks. See, that makes it just a little bit harder. Because like this is, obviously the I and the S are separated on is. So that makes it a teeny, t I mean, not hard, but just a teeny bit harder, okay? So what if the T we encrypt with the first alphabet? So the H we encrypt with the second alphabet. The I we encrypt with the third alphabet. Then the S would be encrypted with the first alphabet again. The I with the second alphabet and the S with the third alphabet. You can see how this would be much harder to do. Imagine, remember those daily jumbles, whatever you had in the Sunday paper years ago? Yeah. Well, imagine if every other position used a totally different set of letters. Normally I do those by looking, okay, I look for the two letter words or the one letter word or the four letter word. You know, it's an A or an at or an it, you know, so on and so forth. But once you start doing this, you can't do it. It's so now the frequencies. I, the number, of, the letter of E's will be all screwed up now. Something called the veneer cipher. I was actually in a class in Atlanta. And this guy was talking about the veneer cipher. I'm like, what? The veneer? No, I said, dude, it's the veneer cipher. Oh, okay. I'm glad I'm learning from this guy. But uh, it's a polyalphabetic cipher based on the veneer tableau. Or table. Okay. Has 26 possible alphabets, each of them keyed by a letter. We're going to look at this here. So our key in this case is Juliet. Okay. So the, the plain text is but soft, what? There's that saying. I don't know. Through yonder window. That's the one. That, that saying right there. Whatever that was, that's the one. Okay. So the B. Is encrypted with the J alphabet, okay? And the result is K. The U is encrypted with the U alphabet. The result is O. We're going to see how this works in a second. The L is encrypted with the T 
alphabet, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's the other way around. The T is encrypted with the L alphabet. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? So far, so good. Everybody see all this? So this can be harder to, to break. Much harder. Okay? There it is. <coughs> so basically, if I want to encrypt Ken, I could go over here. We'll say, my, my, I'm going to encrypt the word Ken, but the key I'm going to use is Bob. So, I find K, I'm going to go over here to the B alphabet, and it's an L. So K becomes L. So E, now I'm using the O alphabet, so I'm going to go all the way over here to O. So, so far I got LS. And then N is back with the B alphabet, and that will be O. So I get LSO is what Ken turns into. See how that works? Pretty easy. Okay. Substitution ciphers like this were considered unbreakable for nearly 300 years. I mean, if you look at the Caesar cipher, remember the Caesar cipher, all we did is we shift the letters over by one. That's all we did. Now we got a whole new complexity to it. We're shifting them by anywhere from 1 to 26. Okay? 19, or sorry, 1863, this Prussian major guy named Kaczynski, kind of important, you know that name, for multiple test questions, proposed a method of breaking the veneer cipher that consists of finding the length of the keyword and then dividing the message up into simple substitution ciphers. So if we could find the length of the keyword, let's go back here for a second. So remember that T was encrypted with the first alphabet. See that? Everybody see that? You see, the T is encrypted with the first alphabet. The S is also encrypted with the same alphabet. Do you agree? The A is encrypted with the same alphabet. This S is encrypted with the same alphabet. And this X is encrypted with the same alphabet. Do you all agree? They're all alphabet number one. Mm -hmm. So if I was to look at just the letters encrypted with alphabet number one, and if we were using English... So I kind of have all these, you know, I got this whole thing here. The most common letter out of all that should be a E. So very easy to figure that out. So then the second one, this H is encrypted with the second alphabet, and I is with the second alphabet, and T. So I take those results, add those up, figure out the frequency of those. Whatever that most common letter is would be an E as well. Everybody see how that works? called frequency distribution. Okay? Some of you look like... <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So. So once we figure out the link, it's just a whole bunch of sensible substitution cybers. I wrote a Java program that almost solves this entire thing. I just... problem is I start working on these, but then the next week comes along and i got to work on another one. So I never quite finished them all. Yeah, a lot of halfways there. It says frequency analysis can be used as all the resulting ones. Okay, how can we break this darn thing? Well, there's something called the Kaczynski method. Here's how it works, and I'm going to show you an example of it, a very detailed example. We're going to look for repeating patterns of three or more letters. So we're going to go through all of our text and look for repeating patterns. I'm going to look for, you know, a uh, and NY or something through it, or just something that's repeating. Okay? Of at least three or more letters. For each pattern, write down the starting position. So I found NNY over here at position 18. So I'm going to write down 18. Okay? Then I find where it repeats again. So it repeats at, you know, 83. So I write down 83. Well, it repeats again at 61. So I write down 60. So I'm writing down the starting positions. Ever with me? I'm going to show you an example of this in a second. Then compute the differences. So if one was at 18 and one was at 83, I calculate the distance. In other words, I subtract you know, 83 minus 18 and get that number. Okay? So I do that for each of them. Then I factor the numbers. So what the heck is factoring? So if I give you a 6, what are the factors of a 6? 3, 2, three, two three, six, 6, and 1 as well. I mean, obviously, one would be a stupid choice, but, I mean, you could. So, uh, okay, what's the factors of 21? 
one twenty one and seven and three. That's it. Okay. So you got to find the factors. Okay. Of the differences between the, the starting positions. Make sure you know it's the starting positions. Don't go well. The character from five. No, it's from the starting positions. So factor them out. Then the key length will be one of those. Usually the most common factor. So if I came up with a key length and I said your key length is either a one, a six, or an eighty-five, what do you think your key length probably is? Six. It's probably a six. The super low numbers, I mean, who would make a key that's one character long? That wouldn't be anything. It would be encrypted with one alphabet. It's a monoalphabetic cipher in this point. And if it's super long, I mean, that's crazy as well, because who's going to use a key that's that long? Okay? So it's not always the number in the middle, but, you know, just common sense here, okay? All right, so the key length will be one of those. Once you get the key length, you can partition it. You know, into all the first alphabets and all the second alphabets, and just do the index of coincidence on those. All right, here's our example. I redid the slide for tonight to really explain it really well. So I got some ciphertext here. If anyone took this class in the past, forget what you learned, because I don't want you to give away the answer. This is my ciphertext, okay? I just put numbers below it so you can keep track of where everything's at, okay? So... I highlighted a repeating string here. So this VLZ IUD LR starts at what position? Uh, Not two. Position. Zero. Twenty. Come on, dude. Look. One. Okay, well, let's, let's start. One. Repeat after me. Two. Three. <laughs> Nine. Ten. That's the only way I can make it do it. If I put ten next to each other, it would have pushed it over by one. So, it starts at position 20, then there's 30, there's 40, there's 50, there's 60, there's 70, there's 80. So, it starts again at 83, and then again at 104. So, our starting positions are 80, I'm sorry, 20, 83, and 104. Okay? Have I got those? So, now we figure out the difference. 20 from 83... Is 63. Then 104 minus 83, again, those are our three positions, is 21. The factors of 63 are 3, 7, 9, 21, and 63. And the factors of 21 are 3, 7, 21. Obviously, we know 1 is common to everything, so you don't know we need to include it. So our common factors in this case are 3, 7, and 21. 3 is kind of short, yet it could be. It could be. On your test, I ask you the three, not your test, on your homework assignment, I ask you the three common factors. Do not include one. Okay? But in this case, you would put in three, seven, and 21. Okay. Okay, let me show you this. You'll notice here, what number did I start with? One. One more time. One. What number is this? One. It's a one. Is it a zero? No. Are you sure? Yes. Boy, I get a lot of people to write a program to do it. Well, if you're writing a program to do it, it's going to start counting at zero. zero. Yeah. Then it could be like, but it's not one. Okay. Technically, the math will come out the same. Think about it. If I had you know, a 19 and an 82 and a 103, the differences would have been the same. But to make it work in mind, the starting position is a 20. Okay? So what do you think the key length is? Probably seven. Seven. Probably seven. So if we look here, this is the way the slides used to be given. So there's my key. So how long is my key? Three. Two. Look at the key at the top. What is my key, first of all? Dickens. Dickens, Dickens, Dickens. See that? So my key is seven. See, this... Plain text and this key combined together gives me this ciphertext. So if I took the plain text I with the alphabet D, I should get L. You agree with that? So I with D, I should get L. Let's go look. Okay, I with D, I get L. You see that? See how that works? 
So the second one, T with I, I should get a B. T with I, this is I, I get a B. Everybody agree with that? So I'm not lying to you. That's what you actually get. All right. So you can do that for all of them if you like. Again, the repeating group is that V, L, V, L, Z, I, U, D. Now, don't count spaces. Okay? If you would like to put it all together with no spaces, that's fine. But for to show on the screen here, there are spaces. So if you count the spaces, that's going to throw you off. Because that wouldn't be 20. That would be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. It's not 23. These are just some of the problems people have when they submit this stuff. They're like, whoa, mine was a 23. No, it wasn't. You kind of space it. Okay? So you see how that plain text with that key made that ciphertext. And by doing those calculations, we knew our key was either 3, 7, or 21. It just happens to be 7 in this case. Okay? Now the assignment, actually we're going to get there. We'll get there. Okay, so infinite non-repeating sequences, these are a way perfect substitution ciphers that are, can't really be broken. So if you have an infinite non-repeating set of alphabets, you know Dickens, 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 Dickens. That's the reason we could break it. The key was repeating. So there's something called a one-time pad, which is just think of this huge string of numbers that go on forever. They're all random. There's no repeating in it. Okay? or a long random number string, mention that, or something called a Vernum cipher, which is a punched paper tape, or a book, or if you had a telephone book, or a Bible, or something. Very easily could, you know, get a hold of your crime counterpart, and say, get the Gideon Bible, because it's in a hotels. Get the Gideon Bible published, published on this day, go to page 82, you know, line 5, there you go, that's where your key could be. That will be immune because, I mean, whatever is on that page, it's non-repeating. Make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. All right. There's something called dual message entrapment. Okay. So what if we have a message that says, this message is crucial. And the key is disregard this message. When you decrypt it, how are you going to know which one's which? Well, I'm that, just say we did that, okay? So if we encrypted that message with a key and got ciphertext, well, when you decrypt the ciphertext, how do you know which one's the message or the key? You wouldn't know. And it's kind of like uh, I covered it in forensics where the uh, um, Francis somebody basically said, uh, you know, said, wait, stay there until I come and get you. Get what the, the thing is. But if you looked at the way he wrote the letters, it actually said flee. So it's kind of prison break. Y'all seen prison break? Okay. Prison break. Season one, uh, what's his face is in the prison and he gets a letter from his son. And if you read the right hand most column down, it was a separate message. So this here, the message could say, you know, disregard, but then also could say this is crucial. Sense? So that's something that's different. You might break it. Oh, well, that's not what I was after after all. So, all right. Well, now? I'm just wondering how that's encrypted. Like, it's not encrypted. We didn't encrypt it. Get, it's, you could. You could take the, uh, the, the T message with the D key and get something. Okay. That's not encrypted at this point. It's just showing you in English. It also just it takes an artist's brain. To read this. Okay, and there's something called columnar. Columnar? Col Did I say it? Columnar? Columnar? Whatever. Okay, so what I'm going to do is if I tell you C10. Okay. So you take your message. This message, wait, this is a message to show how a transposition cipher works. I'll read that. So what it is, we took the message, and after 10 carries, we hit enter. And then we give it to you reading top to bottom. So we give you T-S-O, no, T-S-H-O-H, so on and so forth. 
And how are you going to undo that unless you know the width? Understand? So if you don't know the 10, it'll be all screwed up. All right. How could we break them? Well, we could look for common diagrams and trigrams, look for ENs and REs and so on. I mean, think about it. If I had a column of four, it would be this. It would be quite easy to see. Okay. But yeah, look for common twos and threes and fours and so on and so forth, and then just keep getting larger. Try with the column of two or column of three or column of four until it makes English. You could do that. And you see what I'm saying? So we could take this message here. So if it was a column of two, it would have said TH, then actually the IS would be below, so it would be all screwed up. But keep expanding it until the point where it makes sense. Okay. And computers can actually do that quite easily because it can take each word and look, is that a dictionary word? Yes or no? Okay. All right. Same thing here, that's what they're doing. Okay. Then there's a Python business. There probably is, because you can definitely bring into a dictionary into Python very easily. All right. You could also do dual column. Yeah, that word, columnar. Okay, maybe I did it with 10. Then I took that result and did it with 15. Would that be tougher? Yes. Yeah, because even if you use the sliding window to figure out the 15, well, you couldn't because the result wouldn't be English. So it'll be very hard to do. Okay? How could we do those? Well, there's a relationship between the text and the characters, and I'm not going to make you know how to do that. So you do not need to know this math at all. Okay? Sound good? All right. What if we combine more than one approach? Okay? So we take our plain text, encrypt it with a key, key number one. Then take that result, encrypt it with key number two. So if we encrypted something with Dickens, then took that result and encrypted it with Juliet, what good would Kaczynski's method do? It would be worthless. Okay. I just encrypt the keys, why don't we? Okay. Claude Shannon, another test question. Um, I think it's an extra credit question this time. He wrote something called The Characteristics of a Good Cipher in 1949. It says, the amount of secrecy needed should determine the amount of effort needed to encrypt or decrypt. It's called timeliness. If I am encrypting the Rose State College graduation commencement book from 2017, how much? what's the level of encryption I should have? Compared with the nuclear launch codes. <laughs> you would see this would need a lot less encryption. Encryption costs, en encryption is expensive. Now, does that mean it costs money? It's expensive in time and effort and computer cycles and all that stuff. You, you know, I got a new computer in there. Wow, is it faster. I'm waiting to mess with the PRTK program. It is like, I got a, a real fancy graphics card, which has GPU acceleration on it. It does everything like super quick. It's like, wow, exponentially faster than what I had before. So nowadays with the speed of computers getting faster and faster, your level of encryption might have to increase as well. Okay. Did you all notice? Let me, let me show you this. So I'm going to go to... Uh, this website I don't go to anymore. MSN, msn.com. Okay. So, is MSN encrypted? No. Is there a lock at the top? No. So, if I'm surfing this right now, which I am, if someone at IT services somewhere happened to be capturing my traffic, do they know what I'm doing? Yes. Yes. Is that important? Well, I haven't logged in. I haven't put in any credit card. I'm not paying for anything on here. But now let's look Google. Whoa. I'm literally doing nothing on Google, and it's already encrypted. So what does that mean? 
Which one's safer? Google. Google. Which one I'm going to trust more? Google. But, but it's going to slow us down a little bit. Okay? Because MSN uses the three-way handshake. Okay? Google uses a five-way handshake because it has to for the SSL encryption. It's just one layer of complexity to it. But now that our internet's are so fast anyway, does anyone remember using 2400 baud modems? You might have. I don't know. I learned on a 300 baud modem. I was actually in the lab in Kaiser, Kaiser Slaughter in Germany, Landstuhl Army Naval Station. We were in a room, something like this. We had computers on this wall and computers on that wall. We would literally come over here and type our name, Ken. Walk over there. And then the letters would appear. K. E. <laughs> and that's how fast the network was. I mean, it literally was as a... And that was 300 baud. And then we got to 2400 baud. Whoa. That is like... Phew. Then we got the 40. Then 96. Then 1920. Then 56K. I mean, they kept going faster and faster. But now, I mean... We have gigabit speed here. So the point is, we have the backbone now to handle this. But, so I'm, make, I'm in charge of Google, and I want to make it worldwide now. Okay, we'll use Facebook, for instance. So I'm in charge of Facebook here, and I want everyone in the world to use Facebook, because it's awesome. Obviously, the U.S., I can get streaming video and all that crap. When you bring it up, it automatically plays and keeps playing forever, because our bandwidth can handle it. But what about the Nairobi guy out there with the cheap stuff? You know they have tons of cell phones out there? And Kenya and Nairobi, all those places have tons of cell phones. What do you think their bandwidth is like? It's garbage. So there's actually a different version of Facebook that they run that is basically really stripped down. Um, I, don't, I don't do it anymore, but you know Fandango? I don't know Fandango. Let me show you Fandango if you remember this. Place, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a movie theater place. So much junk on here. Okay? Okay, so much stuff on here now. Yes, right. I used to go to News 9, because News 9 used to have the weather, or not weather, movie listing. It was in pure text. <sighs> Loved it, because I didn't want to see all this junk. And way back with slower internet, even Fandango had a lot of graphics initially, and they started loading. And it would load the first one. And all I wanted was the movie listing. And then the second one would be loading. And then, you know, you couldn't see anything. So then Fandango, actually, I don't know if it's still there. Let's sit. Let's look. I, still, I use it. I get <laughs> mobile. Do they have a mobile site? I use it. Yes, they do. Their mobile site has a lot less stuff on it. Look at that. That's what I see. Okay. So I used to start using a lot of mobile sites because it was less data. So how does all that relate to what tech we're talking about there? The point is, if something's encrypted, it's more data. It's going to be slower. But I just don't like all the junk on MSN. So much junk on there. Okay. So the amount of secrecy needed should determine the amount of effort needed to encrypt and decrypt. What's the value of it? Like, did I really, does Google need to encrypt their home page? No. But are we happy that they are? Yeah, I think it gives us a sense of yay or something, you know. Way back, I used to run a uh, an ISP, and I, I hosted this website. What now? I bet they can still sell on history. Oh, yeah, I think they know everything about us. I used to have this website. Grunk.com. Not a porn site. Okay. I, I actually made this website initially. When he came to me, it was a PowerPoint slide converted to a JPEG stuck on the internet. So I made, remade it for him, made an online catalog and all this. He sells everything. He sells caskets with the marine logos on it. Everything. You know, it's, where's his bumper stickers? Somewhere on there is bumper stickers. It's funny because he came to me and he uh, he's an accountant, the guy who used to own this. He he was he, he bought bumper stickers for a nickel. He sold them for a quarter. Didn't sell them. Why? Why didn't he sell them? Really? 
Not what they were looking for. No, that's exactly what they wanted. They were too cheap. Who wants to buy something for a quarter? It's cheap. It's not worth it. <laughs> took the same bumper sticker, raised it to two fifty. Boom! They sold like hotcakes. Oh my goodness! Isn't that crazy? The same bumper sticker. Think about it. You go to the store, eighteen cents. Nothing. It's got to be cra trash. I want to buy the one for dollar twenty nine or something. You know. <laughs> Tell me it happened. But um, no, I made his website, <laughs> and there's a. You can buy this. So say we're gonna buy this uh, patch over here. I want this third Marine Division patch. It's in there. I'm gonna add it to my sea bag. Boy, they changed a lot since I touched the left. I can go to my cart and I can view all this information and I can put in my credit card and I can buy it right now. I made a made shopping cart that was well initially, but then I switched to a commercial version of shopping cart. Uh, but in during that time period, uh, you have to use what's called a certificate. If you look at here, I don't know if we can even view the certificates anymore. You have to dig into it. Yeah, it's like site settings, then you got to go into certificate somewhere. Well, it's pain in the butt to find. Was that Bob's name? Was that No, that's no. That's no but okay, it used to be easier to see it, but you have to have a certificate, which is a public and private key thing which we haven't talked about yet. It's the thing that's used to encrypt the data between you and the website. Okay? Well, his certificate got screwed up. So I couldn't encrypt his data. So it had the option of having an unencrypted website because it was down for a day. <coughs> I couldn't get a certificate renewed for a day. So I had the option of using the shopping cart with no encryption or just turning it off for a day. What should we do? This dude was selling. He made like nine million dollars last year. Turn off encryption for a day. How many people think complained? Nobody. Nobody ever noticed. Thank God. <laughs> I just taught a, a summer workshop Saturday. Seventy people signed up. Okay. The day before it closed, this girl calls me. I'm like, I really want to sign up for the workshop, but it's not encrypted. I'm like, what do you mean it's not encrypted? I'll be darned. It was not an encrypted form. And I asked for social security numbers. Oh. They all gave them to me. I'm like, I looked. I'm like, you're right. I never went and registered myself. I didn't realize it wasn't encrypted. And it's the place Rose State uses, and it was an old form that was just copied over, so it didn't have encryption turned on. So I turned it on real quick. I was literally like, check, turned on. And that's all it was. We didn't know about it. The point is, a lot of people don't realize that. How many of you didn't realize that MSN was not encrypted? Now, once you log in to MSN, it is encrypted. Really, once you put in personal data, stuff that's important, you should be making sure at that point it is encrypted. Yeah. 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 Well, same with Yahoo. I mean, this dude just sold out. I don't know what he sold it for. But if you mean $9 million in one year... And the funny thing was, I was part of a corporation where we took over his business, but our corporation lasted a whopping one day. And then we split up. But I called him. I'm like, hey, dude, I'm going to fix your website. And he almost didn't call me back. He's like, thank God I called you back. But if I had only charged him a percentage, I charged him 500 bucks oh. For everything. Total redesign, per personalized shopping cart, and everything, 500 bucks. Just think if I charged him 1%. If you mean $9 million this year, I'd be rich. <laughs> I didn't. It's like, damn it. But he's a good guy. So, But now? Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. So, keys and encryption algorithms should be free from complexity. We're going to learn about DES soon. DES was built on secrecy. Very complex, and no one knew why. Bad idea. It didn't last long. Implementation should be as simple as possible. What happens if you get something that's very complicated? What do people do? Yeah, exactly. They don't do it. They don't use it. They throw it away. They don't buy it. They don't recommend it. Errors should not propagate or corrupt the message. So the first packet's corrupted. What should happen to the second packet? Correct. You hopefully it's not corrupted. It should not propagate through them all. Okay? And the cipher text size should be less than the plain text size. So if I have the entire 
Encyclopedia Britannica. Would you like my ciphertext to be the same size? Less. Same size. You would hopefully either the same or less. You don't want it to be bigger. You wouldn't want your encrypted Britannica to be twice as big. Okay? So that's what you can learn out of Shannon's book. Okay. Now let's talk about some trustworthy systems. Okay. First of all, they're based on sound math. Or someone actually thought about what they were doing. Put some time into it. Analyzed by competent experts who have found it to be sound. In other words, people, they've reviewed the code. They've said, yes, this looks legit to us. All right. And it stood the test of time. It lasted for a while. Veneer, that actually lasted for 300 years. Okay. Des, 1977. RSA, AES. AES is still being used today. Actually, Des is still being used today. So was RSA. Okay. So these are some examples of ones that have left. Now, Des is really not used a lot. But it did work, and it still works to this day. It's quite fast. Okay? All right. Confusion versus diffusion. Confusion says interceptors should not be able to predict the effects on the ciphertext by changing one character. So I, I take my plain text, change one character. I should not be able to determine what's going to happen on the output. Okay? You know, Caesar Cipher, change one character, you can kind of see what's going to happen. We don't want that to happen. We do not want one character change to be able to make an exact one character change over there on the ciphertext. So if I encrypted the word Ken and put KBN instead of KEN, I should not be able to see that a certain letter moved over by two on the output. Okay, that's confusion. Diffusion now says changing plain text affects many parts. We like it so that if I take the word Ken, pretend Ken becomes ABC. Okay. Well, if I change it to KBN, it becomes, you know, N, whatever. It, it totally screws up the entire thing. You want diffusion where you change something and it totally affects the entire outcome of everything. And we're going to see how, to, how that happens in a lot of different encryption algorithms. And that's part of the problem. For years, I would assign an AES project where students start. Step one, obviously, and they go through all the way through the end and they get to the final step. What do you think happens if you screw up at step one? So I've changed it. So now you do step one. And then I give you the beginning for step two and you do step two. And I give you the beginning for step three and you do step three. That way if you screwed up step one, it's not going to fix, it's not going to propagate through the rest of your assignment. I mean, I did. I had people that screwed up right at the very beginning, and you can see that error right through all. Well, sorry, dude, you got a 10. So, all right. Stream versus block. Okay. Stream ciphers. We invert. We, we convert our plain text to ciphertext in a stream. In other words, um, as I'm typing, it's going across. Okay. High speed of transformation. In other words, if I type the letter K. The K is encrypted and sent across, so it's very fast, okay? Low error propagation, because I'm encrypting each letter separately, okay? Low diffusion, because really, if I encrypt the K and it becomes something else, really, it's really nothing else, the only one that can be affected. But it's susceptible to insertions. In other words, how do we know, instead of Ken, it wasn't Ken, and someone could have inserted some extra letters in there, okay? Block ciphers. Transposition, transposition ciphers, basically. Now we're going to collect an entire block of text. So think of me writing an entire email and then encrypting it. Okay? Low speed of transformation because I have to write the entire email before it can be encrypted and sent. What if I wrote an email in one character time? You know, like um, on my iPhone, when you start replying to me, if you have an iPhone, I can see your typing. I can't see what you're typing, but I can see that you're typing. Wouldn't it be handy if you could see what they were typing? I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, I do it a lot too. Like, oh, wrong person. <laughs> okay. So low speed of transformation. High air propagation. So I'm writing this email. I screw something up in the middle of the email, and I encrypt it all. <coughs> Potentially, it could all be screwed up. High diffusion. 
<coughs> Again, one piece could go amongst all of it. It's really immune to insertions because I'm really doing an entire block at a time. If I'm encrypting, it's hard to summon for just stick a letter in the middle of it, okay, with the block ciphers. All right. So cryptanalysis says ciphertext only attack. I only know the ciphertext. <coughs> I don't know what the plain text was or the algorithm, but I only know the ciphertext. You try to figure it out. Or there's also something called a known plain text. I know what the plain text was. Why would it be important to know what the plain text was? You can look at the plain text and look at the ciphertext. And again, well, you can write. You can look at the plain text and you can try to figure out what algorithm was used to get to that ciphertext. Probable plain text. I'm pretty sure it was this. Hey, there's a movie out there called Imitation Game. Yeah. It's on Netflix. Excellent movie. It wasn't advertised very much, but anyone seen that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. A little bit? How did you possibly walk away from that movie? I don't think I ever watched it. I think I just saw it commercials. Hallmark Field. Watch that darn game. Movie, not game. <laughs> Imitation game. Watch that movie on Netflix. It's amazing. It's about Alan Turing when he basically broke encryption. It's about the Enigma machine. The Germans, you know? Oh, oh is that the one? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. World War II. Right, yeah. but it's... It's not where they go get the Enigma machine from the submarine. It's the guy who actually writes the code to break it. It's amazing. And yeah, if you watch it, there'll be more later in the class that I'll refer to it, and you'll see, oh, that's what they were, well, that's how they did it, because they're ahead of this. Initialization vector, stuff like that, and it is on the test, too. Not the movie, but a lot of the stuff. Well, the movie should be answered by a question. I might do that. That's a good movie. And we literally, me and Virginia used to go to uh, AMC. Okay, I'm going to admit something here, but hold on. I'm going to pause something here. Now that there's no audio record of that conversation, let's make sure it's actually still recording. Good answer. All right. So, um, so chosen plain text attacks. I, I know the process or chosen ciphertext. Maybe I know the algorithm and the ciphertext. So a lot of different ways of breaking encryption. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this is amazing. It sounds great to you and you want to get into this as a field. Take every math course there is. You really need to know math to do all this stuff. Okay. Once we start going through these, you'll be like, who the heck ever thought of that? So, But read that crypto book and you'll see some of the the thought processes behind when they did this. It's like, where they're eating dinner, having a pizza, and all of a sudden, you know, that kind of stuff. It's kind of interesting. All right. That's the end of that chapter, lecture two. No, it's lecture four. Four. Four.